the first couple of years were terrifying because I didn't know that you're supposed to ask people for money like that that's how you get money because <laughs> I was really yeah. shy and so I showed up in the valley and I'd like go to all these meetings and then I just would never ask anyone for money and I just remember being too shy to ask for like I think maybe a year today my guest is Laura Deming a friend of mine who's the founder and partner of the longevity fund a venture capital firm that's focused on studying aging and life extension in humans. Laura's not your typical VC. She was homeschooled in New Zealand, moved to the US with her family to work in a uh, aging genetics lab at just 12 years old. And at 14, she became a student at MIT, but dropped out two years later after being accepted into the Teal Fellowship Program. We discussed in our conversation her, um, the story about how she became an effective leader, uh, taking risks, dealing with failure, and being motivated to change the world uh, and make it a better place. Now, without further ado, here's my conversation with Laura. Hope you guys enjoy. Cool. Well, thank you so much for joining me on my podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm super excited to have this conversation. Um, how have you been? I think we haven't caught up in a while. It's been about <laughs> six months or so. I think it was sometime in, in the summer. I've been good. Um, I think COVID's been a pretty crazy time. Lots of traveling uh, around the U.S. But um, yeah, it's definitely been interesting. I think to have more time to work on more science-oriented projects. So that that's been that's been pretty fun. Are you traveling for fun or for uh, like for work? <laughs> Yeah, I, so I, I have always been obsessed with Los Alamos just because it's like the haven for science and that's where Oppenheimer was. And so I went there and it was like the best place on earth. Um, so that that was pretty wonderful. Awesome. That's great. Uh, <laughs> so you, you're, you have more time right now to um, focus on like science stuff or like tell me about what you've been spending your time on. Yeah, so I think, uh, and this is more just like a random side project. This isn't necessarily what I've been doing uh, for the majority of the time, but um there's this cool way of like viewing the world that I would call like looking at it, like, like it's kind of like seeing the atoms. So when you look around you, you know, everything's made of atoms, but you don't normally notice that. And so like all this beautiful complexity and depth of the world is, is kind of lost to your very surface level view. Um, and there's these cool exercises that you can do where you try and actually um, anchor yourself to what it would be like to move down a logarithmic scale and see the world on different um, kind of physical scales. And so that's been super fun to just start to do a bit more and to get like a better in intuitive feel for how many orders of magnitude it takes to get down to an atom or a cell or, you know, um, uh, or a virus. Um, so that, that's been pretty cool. So are you, when you're doing that, are you thinking about it in terms of your human scale perception? Cause like your perceptive <laughs> experience would be completely different at like different scales. Yeah. So it, it's sort of like, you know, when you were a kid and you saw this um, comic book, like the Magic School Book. And that's what I was have... going to say. Is it like, <laughs> like Magic School Bus where like you're in the bloodstream or whatever and seeing like white blood cells, but it's like you're seeing them in, you know, they're red or whatever, or they appear, you know, like it appears like everything's lit up uh, with like, kind of like you were outside the body, but just... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, exactly. So I was watching this really cool talk by a guy called um, Nima Arkani Hamed, and he has this whole discussion of how in physics, it's really nice to think about, you know, big stars um, and to think about them in terms of how many, for example, proton um, nuclei would fit in the star. And that actually gives you this really cool intuition for the magnitude of it and what it could be composed of. And it gives you all these cool associations. And in biology, there's a lot of um, focus, I think, on not that, but like if you start applying that same mindset to biology and try to visualize a lot of basic concepts and papers at the atom level, it's just incredibly cool. Like for example, did you know um, a virus might have like 580 kind of atom lengths um, to, to cross it? And that's, you know, such a conceivable number. It's like, that's the number of YouTube views and kind of like a, you know, sort of a, a starter YouTube video, but that's the number of atoms it would take to cross a virus. And so you can actually kind of imagine it pretty, pretty clearly, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that is cool. <laughs> So are you doing like a visualization and just uh, kind of imagine, it's almost like a meditative exercise actually. Yeah, actually it's really cool. So what, what you can do is um, you can try to come up with like say 10 objects. So it takes 10 jumps of an order magnitude of a 10X to get down to an atom. So you can try and imagine like 10 objects between you and this atom and then sort of imagine what it'd be like to zoom into that object mentally. 
And it's kind of cool because like when you do that a lot and you hear then different like reference objects, you start to get a feeling for when someone describes a concept to you, like in, in some you know very ed, ed, edge cases, like is that feasible or not? Like, okay, like you're talking about, you know, something getting pushed by something else, but that like thing is as big as, you know, a thousand atoms, the other thing is like, you know, one atom. So it doesn't make sense that like one could actually have an impact on the other, except it was like moving at very high velocity, which is, which is not. Um, so yeah, sorry, it's like probably a random rad, but just like, it, it, it's just really cool to start to build better intuition for like the atom scale, I think. Um, awesome. That's so cool. <laughs> um, well, I want to find out what else you've been doing more recently, but I, the podcast, is all about like people's origin stories and then how they got to the place that they are and the, the ups and downs of, of getting there. Um, and so I'd love to like, if we can zoom back to the beginning and just talk a little bit about how you got into all of this and into, you know, being an investor at such a young age and like, what was, you know, where did you come from and like, what put you in the position to be uh, such a young VC and working on longevity? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Um, so I had a pretty weird, I guess, origin story. Um, I grew up in New Zealand, like, sort of just doing um, whatever I wanted at home. We were homeschooled, which was awesome, was super fun. Um, and I remember my dad would just give me like books about physics and chemistry and biology, and I would read those. And, like that was school. Um, and then I would like do that for the first half of the day, and the second half of the day would just be like doing whatever, whatever the heck. Um, and basically, when I was twelve, I moved to the U.S. to start working in a lab on um, aging genetics. And so I actually got to work in the lab of one of the leaders in the field, Cynthia Kenyon. Um, she's really well known and she's an incredible individual. Um, I think one really funny fact is, you know, she's she's usually been, I think, on the forefront of things that a lot of people said were crazy. So, you know, when she was a young, you know, kind of female professor at UCSF and she was working on developmental biology, everyone said in the 1980s, it was absolutely crazy to um, look for aging genes. Like they just wouldn't exist. And yet she went ahead and actually um, you know, pioneered the studies that, um, you know, after the, the original studies of Tom Johnson and Michael Klass kind of showed that these were a real thing. And that's just, that's just so incredible. And so I got to work in her lab and was really inspired by that. Um, and then I went to college briefly. And then basically, um, there's this kind of interesting thing in biotech where unlike tech, where there's, you know, I think a lot of information now, you know, thanks to people like yourself about how to go from, you know, an idea to a company and biotech, it's often something that's done by um, people who are, I'd say older who have more experience in the field and rightly so it's a very difficult and complex process um, but for kind of like a young undergraduate you don't have any visibility into what all is going on and um, I was really confused about why all the aging science that like was awesome was not being translated into drugs and so that's why I decided to start a venture capital fund um, to help kind of make more of that translation happen basically. That's that's amazing there's so much in there but I like I just have a question like what was your homeschool like how did your parents decide to homeschool you and just it sounds like there, there was a really supportive learning environment and as someone with like I just had a, my first kid I'm particularly curious in how to like create that kind of environment like what was it that you thought um what what inspired it you know for your parents yeah so I think um I used to read all these Feynman transcripts of him talking about his childhood, you know, just for inspiration. And it's funny because when he describes his dad, I had this Asian movement where I was like, oh, like, that's my dad too. Um, like, you know, my dad used to, you know, at night when he was talking to me and he would tell me like, um, you know, the origin stories of great scientists like, Ma like, like Faraday or Maxwell. And so my heroes are Newton. And like, you know, for example, for Christmas, like we, we always called it like Newton miss or something, or like, you know, it was like Isaac Newton's <laughs> birthday, not Christmas. And so like growing up, there was all this really strong motivation that science was really cool, that like scientists were the best people ever. And like specific stories, like for example, um, Maxwell when he was, a, um, or sorry, not Maxwell, Faraday when he was a teenager, went and um, sat in on the lectures of a famous scientist. And like, that's how he got his start in the industry. Those are really inspiring to me as, you know, an uh, example of what I could do to get started in science. Um, it was like, I, I'd say a lot due to my dad, um, just kind of being really excited about this field. Was he a scientist? Um, no, he, he's like Feynman's dad. He loves science, but he just kind of, you know, loves to think about it from like a interest perspective. It, it's not something that he did professionally. Amazing. That's amazing. And so, <laughs> your whole family moved with you when you were 12 to, so that you could work in Cynthia Kenyon's lab. Is that right? Yep, exactly. So I, I'm basically just extremely, like, I, I think there's like, like emailing her was obviously a good idea, but then I'd say- um, So like, you just cold, probably, you cold emailed her? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I basically, cause she's one of the first people when you search in genetics, at least, especially back then that you'd see, there was like, you know, very little going on in the field, but she had pioneered it. And she also, I remember, 
when I searched her, she just looked really cool. And I really wanted to like be like her just when I saw, you know, what, what she was doing. And so I emailed her and said that I wanted to visit her lab. And like, it changed my life when she wrote back and said that I could. Um, so that, that was totally crazy. That's, that is, so what inspired, did you, I mean, I'm sure you, she told you later or you asked like what made her want to have like you, the 12 year old Laura come and, and work with her? Well, so I actually wasn't special in that regard. Like Cynthia's a, she, she's a very special, like wonderful person. Like she, she's done that actually, I think for, you know, other young people, like, I mean, she, she, and she doesn't have a lot of time so she can't do it like obviously a ton, but um, like she, that wasn't the first time that I think she helped someone young get into the field. And like, I remember even when I was in the lab, there was somebody else who was also a teenager who was lucky enough to be able to work there. Um, and that was just due to kind of, I think her being really supportive and helping people who were, you know, young get, get into the industry. So, um, and, and then I think Cindy is also just really special. Like it, it really, it takes us, you know, in entrepreneurship, it takes a special kind of mind to see an idea that everyone else calls crazy and to take it forward. In a similar yeah. way, like, you know, Cynthia is the kind of scientist who, despite everyone saying something wouldn't work, you know, herself took a crack at it and just showed that it did and then built a whole new field or, or helped build a whole new field and out of that discovery. Yeah, one thing I've seen in myself and, and friends of mine, and I have probably a lot of mutual friends of ours, actually, it's like the people who, you know, they had this experience of kind of having to figure something out on their own and really believing in something and uh, and then seeing it vindicated later on, you know, maybe yeah. years later, are more interested and inclined, it seems, to to be trying to find that in others and take risks on people who are young, have less experience, you know, whatever, whatever it is. Um, that's totally. kind of what I've seen. It's like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so from there, you went um, and you went to MIT for a little bit. Is that right? Yeah, so I went to MIT for two years. It was the first time I'd ever been in school. Um, so that was an interesting experience. Um, and I worked in an aging lab while I was there. And, and then I left after two years to take the, the Teal Fellowship. Was that the first Teal Fellowship batch? Yeah, it was the OG Teal Fellowship patch, yeah. which was really fun. Yeah. What was what was that like? I'm I'm so fascinated and curious because like it's <laughs> like I th I think people don't talk about the Teal Fellowship very much, but I mean it's responsible for such a huge amount of world change and value creation. Like even if you just yeah. include Ethereum, right, as 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 part of it, but like I, what what was that first Teal Fellowship batch like? Um, I mean, it was totally crazy. I think what I remembered vividly was that um, I think the story is told publicly now, but like they like that basically they'd had the idea in a car ride to a you know conference and then just implemented it. And so like, I think in the first year, there weren't a lot of strong priors around, you know, you have to do things this way, you have to do things that way. And they gave us like a lot of leeway. And there were really funny things like, for example, um, I thought that my project was so cool and like, you know, they were so on board. And then the guy who ran the fellowship later told me, that like they had thought it was going to fail and they were like just waiting for me to like wake up and realize it but like they never told me that I shouldn't work on it which was really cool of them I think they just were super supportive and they were like you know as long as you want to work on this we're here for you which is great I remember vividly uh, living with a bunch of other Teal fellows in a house on the same block as Steve Jobs and you know the one night that we get there seeing all these black cars outside of our house and we didn't know that we were on the same block as Steve Jobs so we couldn't figure out why there were all these really creepy surveillance vehicles um, and I remember we ended up baking cookies to go bring out to like the driver to just like try and we I think we we're just having fun that night, but it, it's there's like a lot of really crazy memories that I have from like this, this time period. Um, and it's been really interesting to see, I guess, decade later, like how all of that panned out and like kind of where everyone ended up. What was, so I realized I'm a terrible host and I should have said that, you know, introduced for the, <laughs> the, the listeners who don't know about the Teal Fellowship, basically this idea that Peter Teal had to fund people, young, promising people who wanted to drop out of college and he would give them a hundred thousand dollars. I don't even think it was an investment, right? It was just a grant to yeah. do whatever they wanted, right? Like or whatever project that they, they wanted. So your project was, was it the fu fund at that point or were you working on a specific aging problem? So I think for a while I was bouncing around working on different fund ideas. Like my actual first idea that I used to, um, that I, I first tried to apply with was actually it was around um, trying to help scientists get better like um, reward for the work that they did and that was just like way it was like even compared to an aging venture fund that was like actually maybe too ambitious <laughs> I, think it was, like, the level of ambitious. I should pro maybe probably do that now but but anyhow um, 
like at the time, um, yeah, it was sort of like this idea of aging venture funds, getting more money for aging, investing in aging companies. Um, and so that, yeah, that, that, that was kind of the main focus. So how'd you go about it? Like you're, were you 18 at the time or 19? Like how, <laughs> how did you yeah, like so, go, you had a hundred thousand dollars. Like I think of someone when I was before, like the last couple of years, if, if someone had handed, handed me a hundred thousand dollars would like, go make a venture fund, I would just like not know what to do. You know, like how, what were the <laughs> steps by which you figured out how to do it? Yeah. I mean, I think it was a lot of failure uh, for a very long time and also a lot of luck. And then eventually, I mean, I think I was also just lucky in a lot of ways, you know, for example, like people that I got connected to early ended up investing later, but like, I think, you know, I, if I were to do it over again, I would say there's like a chance that, well, actually, no, I think, I think I would have figured it out in the end, but, um, I mean, basically the first couple of years were terrifying because I didn't know that you're supposed to ask people for money. Like that, that's how you get money. <laughs> Cause I was really yeah. shy. And so I showed up in the Valley and I'd like go to all these meetings or I was pitching these really nice people and some of them were willing to give a lot of great feedback and then I just would never ask anyone for money and and like so I just never got any feedback like you know because eventually you don't have to do that eventually when your pitch is good enough people will ask you to give you money but like when you start like it's really useful to try and really hold someone and say you know to the fire and say like you know why why not like what a specific reason and I just remember being too shy to ask for like I think maybe a year and so yeah. you know just like really really simple things like that it took a long time to pick up on. Um, and then I think there were other things like I didn't understand why people invested in things. So I spent a lot of time with all these graphs and charts and like you know, people just kind of already knew that aging was a deal that I, that I was talking to. Like they had already accepted that. So I was pitching something that they you know, already knew. And then they, like there were things that I took as obvious, like for example, the technology is you know real that were really hard, I realized for most people to understand without some evidence. And so to them, a graph wasn't really good enough. Like a photo often was like way more compelling because it's sort of like, here literally two animals which have been treated, you know, with um, something that made them live longer. And here's like photographic evidence, you know, that like these animals really exist and something about that was very compelling. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of those two years was just learning basic pitching techniques um, and, and not doing the one thing that I should have done at the start, which is, you know, go pitch 50 people and just get all that feedback, like as quickly as possible. Um, which in retrospect would have been more, a more intelligent thing to do. So where, where did your first break come from? Like, where'd you get your first check? <laughs> um, so my first check, I think, came from my mentor, Stan, Stan Tamkivi. Um, and this was, like, he had been um, helping me for a long time with my pitch. And I remember just, like, one day, I was on a phone call with him. And he was just like, yeah, I'm, like, willing to invest or something. And I was like, wait, look, <laughs> we've been talking for a year. And I just kind of realized that he had watched, I think, me for long enough. And he'd been really helpful, too. And I guess maybe he just realized that I wasn't going to give up or something, but he, he like was one of the, the people who took like a very early bet on, on me. And so I'm you know, super grateful to him still for, for his support. And it, it's been like really meaningful, you know, to have that first person bet on you. Yeah. And so tell me like, once you got some money, once you started getting money, how did you, like, how did you invest it? How did you become <laughs> able to like meet the companies that were, you know, that you could support? Yeah, so I was actually really lucky in, in that sense as well. Um, and I'd say literally lucky because I ended up working in an office where um, a guy down the hall of the office that I was in um, came by to visit his friend and he left his business card because his friend mentioned that I was working on aging stuff on my desk. And it turned out he was working on this aging company that was going to be later because that one of the bigger deal aging companies to IPO like you know in X number of years, but I didn't know that at the time. So I went to see him and he was just this like really visionary CEO who had a lot of great biology that he wanted to take forward. And um, he was in the middle of closing his first round. And so we were really lucky we got to invest, you know, in that first round. Um, and I think it, it was just maybe partially because like there weren't any other aging funds. And so it was sort of like this crazy idea that like nobody else would um, ever think was a good idea, which is like to make a venture fund for aging. like. The fact that we were, were focused on that maybe made us a candidate to invest in this company, but I mean, I, I think we're really lucky to 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 be able to work with them on that one. That's awesome. It's um, I realized I should have asked this in the beginning, but like, why did were you so fascinated with this problem, with the problem of aging, and where did that come from? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I think in a sense, it's the ultimate problem. Like, you know, we we focus a lot on disease and. So there's kind of this, this interesting thing where people always talk about disease, right? Like as though it has some inherent meaning, um, but in, in a sense, like it doesn't really, like, like a lot of things we call diseases, some of them are caused by different things. So there's not necessarily like 
um, you know, one causal reason for the disease. Some of them are just groups of symptoms, which, um, you know, is not necessarily a, a great kind of way to classify disease. And so I think um, aging to me feels like a more direct way to see what we're trying to do, which is make people healthier for longer, right? And, and however we do that is kind of great. So that, that's the first reason. I think the second reason is that there's this really strong history of a field called aging genetics, which basically tries to change genes to make animals live longer. And like, this is a very real field that has a lot of really extraordinary biology. And I think people really undersell the fact that we can do this. Like, you know, you are on the order of 10 trillion or, or, or 10 trillion. Yeah, actually about 10 trillion cells. Um, and, you know, a mouse is maybe you know, a hundredth of that or something. And the fact that I can change one of like the, you know, tens of thousands of genes in a mouse and with a single like change, increase its lifespan by like 60%. That's fairly insane. I think that's actually a really interesting fact about biology. And that kind of points us to like where we might be uh, sort of able to look for, for more and better medicines. So this was, but you were interested in this like at a very young age, right? Like when you were in, when you were 12, you wanted to work for Cynthia. Was this a problem that like <laughs> you knew, like this was like the problem you want to spend your life on? Yeah, I mean, to me, it was kind of like, a bigger deal than cancer. It's like you work on cancer, you work on aging, and like aging is a bigger deal than cancer. So like that—that's the better problem to go work on. It was about the extent of the thinking at the time. I think that makes yeah. sense. I, so, have there been any other longevity funds now? Like you were mentioning, you're the only one, and I think you're the only one I've ever heard of. I'm curious if like other people kind of gone into this now. Like it's, I feel like aging over the course since we—I think we yeah. met in 2014 or 2015, and you had just raised your first fund. Um, and I remember like when I was, I, I was thinking about it, it became like a very top of mind problem for me. I was like, oh my God, I'm going to die someday. And that seems like a huge problem that I should be trying yeah. to figure out how to solve. And uh, you were referred by a mutual friend. And, and at the time, like, I don't think anybody was working on this, but then since then, it seems like it's, it's gotten a lot more attention, um, both from the investment community, but also, also like from the community of entrepreneurs, like what's happened in the last you know, since you started this in this industry or started the yeah. industry, I guess. <laughs> no, totally. I mean, it's it's definitely, um, I would be so done to take credit for it. It's, it's all the other people who have done good science and the people who are translating that out. And I think we we played a small mi minor role in like just being very vocal about the fact that the field was a real field, um, but it's fairly insane. So there's been on the order of 4 billion that's come into the field like in the past, you know, four to five years. And there's all these companies now that have raised, you know, hundreds of millions each to do different kind of big play aging projects. Um, Calico, which was, I think a really big deal for the field occurred you know, about that amount of time ago when we first met. And what that did, I think was in large part give it credibility. So Art Levinson, who's former CEO of Genentech, whenever started Calico and the fact that someone I think who was so respected in the field known to really value rigor was willing to like associate his name with the field of aging. That was actually a huge deal because I don't know how it is in tech, but in biology, I think there's like a, a, like there's a huge kind of hesitance around new ideas because they can be so expensive to test out. And so it's sort of like, you really want someone who you trust in a sense, sometimes to vet like a field first, but then of course that's, that leads to like this self-starting problem. Yeah, and so um, like what's happened in terms of, uh, you know, advancements in the, in like where, where were we like when you started and like what's happened now? Yeah, so I, I kind of usually, I think divide aging into maybe three generations. So. First gen, I think, is all about taking the discoveries of the past couple decades and translating them into like the therapies of tomorrow. Um, and these will be like almost disappointing therapies. They'll be really small effect size. They will look like normal therapies. They won't have any major innovations. The whole point is that you don't need to change a lot of your drug development toolkit to make these, um, but that's what you'll see first. And so very traditional kind of like metabolic interventions I think are gonna be first there. Like Second a gen, human, there's been clinical trials for metformin for aging, right? Someone just funded that. That would be like an yeah, example so, of that category. You know, I, I can never, I think, really tell when those trials will start just because, I mean, it's, I have so much respect for near bars light. That's an enormously hard thing to pull off. And I think, um, like, I'm not sure if they're, they're, they've started or, or kind of when that will happen, but I think um, actually, like, so the, 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 there's actually that, that brings me to distinction. So the first aging drugs, I think actually will not even be approved for aging. They'll be super sneaky. Like they'll be drugs that target aging pathways, but that are approved for um, cancer or Alzheimer's because it's the best go to market. Like 
you know, if you think you're a startup, a little startup, and you're trying to go after this big hairy problem, and like you can choose between, you know, having a market in hand like as soon as possible versus trying to run, you know, like a decade long, you know, sort of really expensive clinical trial, like, you know, just to survive, you're gonna try and go after the first. Um, and I think the second is what people are kind of heroically trying to also do in a lot of different ways. Um, but like a, a startup might choose to just take whatever market they can get first. But so yeah, what, what I think you'll see first is just these really normal looking drugs with very small effect sizes um, that may be approved even for not aging things, but where it's kind of like the biology of aging is, is proving that it actually is helpful in pre age related diseases. They'll, they'll come from the field of aging. That's kind of what, you know, describes them. The second gen, I think is gonna be a lot more about um, like finding new ideas for targets with the new tools that we have. And then also a really important development has been um, the new kinds of ways we can drug people. So we can now use proteins, we can use cells, we can use viruses um, as drugs themselves. And that's a big deal because it opens up the toolkit of what we can target. And so that's gonna be kind of a whole, um, I think new playground of both like what to do and how to do it that comes next. And I think third gen is a big question mark, which is like, you know, regenerative medicine in the most kind of ambitious way possible, like what are these massive ideas that can be turned into reality? Um, and I think that's an area where just, there, there's a lot more uncertainty about how fast it will take. Like with a lot of the stuff, I think it's pretty clear that will happen at some point. Um, but like the big question is just whether it will happen like in our lifetimes, which is kind of what, we're, what, we, what we hope to happen. What's your outlook? I think you told me back in 2014, you were like, it's not gonna happen for you. <laughs> Maybe in a kinder way, but you, you know, like the, the advancements in aging would be just kind of like you thought that they would not, um, we, we would not extend to kind of human lifespan during my generation long enough that, that, uh, you know, like we'll figure out some sort of way to, to keep ex extending it. I do, has that changed? Yeah, I think, um, I'm both more and less optimistic, like, um, so, so, so the big, the, the big question, it, it really goes back to this concept that I think Aubrey de Grey first described, which is like longevity escape velocity, which is sort of, you know, can you increase lifespan in your generation enough that you get the benefits of innovation, you know, that, that come just after you would have normally died. And that I kind of have no, no clue about. Um, I, I think like there are some exciting trends that might point towards exponential increase innovation. So one example would be that we have, again, so many new ways to drug people. And like, we that's really a recent thing. That's a really extraordinary thing that's happened in biology. I think the second thing is that um, in biology, we're now using like the discoveries of biology to become the next gen tool. So CRISPR, for example, which you've probably heard about is itself a biological entity that was discovered by a biologist. And for a very long time, biology was not a field that like made its own tools. Um, and I think that's just a really fascinating flywheel to watch. Um, and it'll be curious to see if that affects like at all the pace of progress. Um, but, you know, there's always a world in which like neither of those two things is sufficient. And, you know, for example, like there, there's many centuries in which microscope innovation, I think essentially stagnated. Um, we, we didn't get better kind of tools. And like, that's the kind of thing where you're like, well, like that, that's not, you know, what, what if that happened again? It, it'd be hard to predict, I guess. What do you think the, are the biggest inhibitors of progress then? <laughs> so I'm so fascinated by this question. Like there, there's, yeah. um, I think it's really interesting to try and dive into, you know, why biological progress happens at the rate that it does and like what prevents something from being discovered earlier. Um, and like, I mean, I think I and a lot of other people would kind of view it through the lens of like what you can see and what you can do. So like right now, if I want to go change your DNA, right? I can't do that. I like, I mean, I, I, I can in a very limited way. I can, I can change your DNA in a subset of your cells in a somewhat noisy way, you know, statistically significantly, but like, um, you know, but, but I, I can't pick an arbitrary cell in your body to go like manipulate and change. And so that, that's, like, that's like a technical problem. Like we, we can work on solving things like that. Um, if I wanna see what's going on in just a cell, right? Like one cell um, of which you have like a trillion to track, I, I can't do that. Like I, um, e if I use a light microscope, the most I can get down to is about 200 nanometers, right? Which is, which is about like uh, thousands of atoms still like across. And so if I want to look at a virus, like I can, I can barely see like, you know, kind of the virus result. And, and I think, um, yeah, so there, there's, 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 there's like both this idea that like maybe you can use um, genetics and some kind of higher level like causal inference to you know, understand what's going on there. But also there's just like, you can't look at the atoms yet. And like, if we could do that, maybe we could just see, you know, what was going on in a lot of cases. Um, and so it's, it's kind of, you know, will microscopy do that? Will sequencing as a readout somehow couple something else do that? It's like, it's just kind of technical problem of like getting down this level of resolution. And then the last thing is like, well, what if you want to do something, right? Like say you want to move a 
Adam from one end of the cell to the other, like, you know, how are you going to do that? Like, you don't have a little go-kart that just like carts it over. You kind of have to, you know, hack it together, uh, like you have to move a group of atoms and, you know, significantly in a population of cells. And so it's just kind of like these really fascinating, like now technology problems that are, you know, still unsolved or super hard. And that like, you know, we're like the, the whole field is working really hard on. Um, I mean, it's a very exciting time. <laughs> do you think those those problems will be solved in our, you know, in the in the kind of near future, I guess it's, or do you have, not have a predictive outlook on it yet? Yeah, so I, I have no idea. Like, I, I am not a nanotechnologist. Like, I am not Ed Boyden or any, like, genius working on this stuff. I think um, what's clear is that the ways that we're solving the problems are changing in a really interesting way. So, like, you know, in the past, if you wanted to solve a microscopy problem, you might work on optics, right? And then maybe next thing you'd work on, like, electron microscopy or something. And, like, today, people are batting about the idea of using, like, sequencing. So, like, literally, like, using biology itself to act as an information readout inside the cell. And that's, that's such a new different way of thinking about things that it's just it's just kind of like hard to predict where that will go, especially if you're outside the field, which I am. Um, but I think stuff like that just kind of gives me hope because it's sort of like a decade ago, I could, you know, I naively would never have predicted that that would be how people thought about things. But it's so obvious, you know, now that that's, you know, a massive important way to go. Um, and so that's, that's kind of like a source of hope for, okay, in the future, maybe there'll be more things like that, or we'll, we'll go more quickly than, than, you know, than we thought we would. Amazing. Um, so what is your own, I, I guess maybe a more practical question for the, for the listeners, like what's your longevity regime, if anything, are you doing anything now to like, you know, extend your lifespan in the future? Yeah. So I think, um, I mean, the, the short answer to that is like, no, <laughs> there, there, there's nothing. Um, I, so I used to have like, um, I think stock answers to this and I think I've just started refusing to answer it because like a like the correct answer to that should be very personalized like um like we just know now so much more about like the individual nature of like response to an intervention that like I could tell you something that in the aggregate would help most of your listeners but like maybe hurt some of them right and so that would be like maybe responsible depending on like you know their amount of prior knowledge but then I think I think yeah. also it's just not my area of expertise like like and basically I focus on like thinking about 100 atom molecules and like what you're talking about is like you know at minimum like trillions of like atoms of complexity in a like you know uncertain <laughs> format specified by like one overall like word as like you know should you have more or less of that and it's like well i like, yeah. you know, like <laughs> um uh for for what i think about it, it's, it's actually not like i think the place where i'd be the most helpful well do you think let me ask another question that do you think that people should be concerned about it or like thinking about it or do you think there's any like there are inter like it's worth people's time to spend time on interventions that may lead to like a better outcome for the future for them yeah i mean i think um people should probably spend time getting to understand how to control their behavior like i mean the basic psychological hacks of i mean that you probably talked about a lot on this podcast um and, and then like making sure that they don't sustain like bad habits um but i'd say that a lot of the like fad stuff that sweeps every five years is just really wrong or like it's right but then like the way that's applied is just totally wrong to like I think what the science actually says um so I don't like I think maybe the expectation could be that like if you do a really extreme fad diet like you're more likely to cause yourself harm or something it was you know it's sort of just like I don't I don't put a lot of stock I think in like that like very extreme approach um yeah <laughs> Sorry, gotcha. not, not too no, no, no. yeah no, that's a, that's interesting. Um, cool. And so, uh, how, tell me about like, what's been difficult about starting a venture fund? Like what are the hardest moments in, in kind of, um, have that in building the fund? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think for me at the start, it was just this conflict between making money and like finding novel technology and, um, I think bio has had this like real bugbear around being seen as you know lower performing than tech, being seen as slower than tech. A lot of the no's that I used to get were people saying, "Oh, you'll never get an exit because it takes decades to make a drug, and you know so you'll never be able to return in the length of a venture fund what we need." And um, like if you're in the field, you just know that's not true. Like you exit companies often like a long time before they have like you know an approved marketed drug if they have something that looks great. As, as efficacious, they make an acquisition offer, they may build IPO. 
Um, and so just, I think basic misconceptions about bio from the like general investor landscape were, were pretty hard at the beginning. Um, and then I think also like maybe just the most understated thing is aging is like an incredibly hard field. Like when I started, I was like, yeah, it's like five words and they're connecting these causal graph and like, that's how it works. And now I know that like, okay, your body is again, like it's 10 to the 27 atoms. And like, you don't get to escape that complexity. It's like, you're, I'm, I want to give you a hundred thousand atom object. And maybe I want to give you like, you know, a million of those or something or more than that. And like, those are going to somehow like through these complex set of like computations interactions make your body like live longer like what <laughs> like that's an insane feat and the fact that we can even approach doing stuff like that for any disease is incredible and we should be so amazed by that every day like it's literally like when you're in the industry when you're outside the industry it's like oh like you know this weird plant stuff that was mashed up and like then you eat it and like that's you know some question mark why it works but like if you're in the industry you're like oh my god like these are nanobots that we're telling them where to go and like it's insane that we can do this um, and so, but like the, the, the problem is like, there's no level at which you get to just give up. Like, like say I'm talking about like making an antibody against a protein in your body, right? Like I don't get to just like say, I'm gonna, okay, do function, make antibody for X proteins. Like I have to go think about like every atom on that antibody and like what the sequence of it is and how it's made. And like, I have to make it in nanofactors of living cells in these big vats, and, like make sure those cells are right. It's like, you just have this huge, like the biggest worst supply chain ever of complexity and non-robustness and like stuff that you can't see, but that's like, you know, tiny nanofactory. And so that, I mean, that's been the hardest thing is like, you don't get to escape that at any level. That's always there. And aging is trying to address all of it. Um, so yeah. <laughs> so how, how have you, how have you dealt with that? I guess, like how, have you, I guess it's been, you know, it's, it's, it sounds like the problem that you've set out to solve, so to work on, it's like much more complicated. Like, where do you think, like, where have you been able to find places where, uh, you know, you have been able to like have conviction around, um, you know, some sort of strategy for, for attacking the problem. Yeah. So this is where I think it's like so cool that we saw what we saw in the 1990s. So there were these like canonical experiments where, um, you know, again, like people change single genes and they just observed that like, this change results in increase in lifespan. And the idea was that like evolution had somehow like, you know, tried to be modular in creating these pathways. And so that's why we got lucky and they existed. But like, um, it, it's just like, we we know that there are some genetic pathways that if change can make sort of increased lifespan happen, at least in, in mice. And that's like, that's such a gift from nature. Like we, we never like, you know, there, there's no reason that we, we should have started out with that. And so that, that's kind of one thing to start with is that like, we have these observations about how reality is giving us material to work with and like we, we can use that. I think the other thing is like biology does, okay, there, there, there are some levels at which you can abstract, but just sort of like every time you do, it's sort of like you have to be darn sure that like the stuff under that, you, you never lose the reason you could abstract in the first place. Um, and so, yeah, I, I guess I'm like, you don't actually think about all the atoms all the time, but like that, that just so often does come back to like bite you when you're trying to send a process. And tell me about your aging accelerator. Are you still, uh, <laughs> like how it be, it sounds like what part of what you've tried to do is kind of like what Y Combinator did with startups, technology startups, like make it easier for people is to kind of have the infrastructure to start a company. If you're trying to do that with biotech startups, is that fair? Like, how's that gone? Like what, what's, what's that experience been like? Yeah, totally. So, so we were so lucky to work with like, you know, a couple of really amazing teams um, in, the, in the incubator. And I think, um, you know, the incubator started when um, we were looking at this graph of, I think it was number of companies um, year over year in biotech, and then amount of funding year over year in biotech. And there was one year where the amount of funding doubled, but the number of companies stayed the same, which kind of indicated that like, even though biotech venture capital firms had more money to deploy, they were putting more into the same companies. And that just felt really weird because, you know, either like you have no good ideas, which like definitely didn't seem to be the, the case to, you know, add to the yearly company creation output or not enough good people. And like, really what we learned thinking about this problem is like large biotech venture capital firms often make their own companies and they can't just double their staff, you know, on the turn of a dime. And so you're kind of bottlenecked by company creation. And so this just seemed like an incredibly insane opportunity for like people to start biotech companies. It's just like, you know, the field's taking off and we're literally bottlenecked by like, you know, people, you know, who are ambitious enough and who are like 
mission oriented enough to like start these great companies. And so that, that's kind of why we started the incubator. I think is just just seeing that specific opportunity that that year was just insane. Um, and and how did um, like what have you learned starting it? Um, I think, so I think maybe the biggest thing is that, um, like when we started originally, I thought that like, it'd be a lot of strategic advice that we, we'd be telling the entrepreneurs, you know, a lot of specific things. And I think really it was always down to, you know, whether somebody felt good, whether they were correctly motivated, like whether they had the right ambitions for themselves and kind of like their self-perception and, you know, all the entrepreneurs that we work with are amazing, but I think just like the prediction for their success was so much more tied to like them just keeping a clear head and being able to just like deal with problems. I think that any of the specific strategy stuff that like they all like their entrepreneurs started out with like strategies that just like in retrospect, like I, I would say, wow, like, you know, that could totally have not worked, but then they just, you know, found a hack and, and an amazing way to like actually pull it off. And like now it's a great business plan, but like it was nothing to do with like giving specific business plan advice. It was all about them just having this like insane drive to, to win and to like, you know, pull these, dr these drugs to market. Yeah. It's, it's uh, surprisingly much more about the founders than it is about their strategies and like the yeah. right founder will figure out a working strategy eventually if they persist at it, but like put a great, great strategy together with like founders who are not motivated or going to give up and it like, it will never work. Exactly. I had to spend, had to spend a lot of money to figure that out. <laughs> Um, cool. Well, um, what could someone who has it, who's not in the field, like do to, um, you know, kind of aid the field of longevity. It's kind of like in everybody's interest to care about this, right? Yeah, no, I, I think that's, um, such a great question. And, um, I, I think maybe the, the, the biggest thing is just people don't know how much the field needs more great founders. Like it's really bottlenecked in large part now, I think by great people. Um, there's lots of great ideas like that are just amazing. Like business opportunities were like, you know, I, I think my, um, uh, my, my, my partner and I at the fund, we, we, all, we always kind of joke about how like we were just like so annoyed that like there's certain ideas that we want to spin out and we just don't have the time or like the manpower ourselves to do it. Um, but like we don't necessarily want to like you know just immediately kind of um, uh, give them because they're really great ideas. But like um, it, it, the field is totally bottlenecked on people, and so it's just kind of like there's that. There, there's also a lot of the best founders that I've worked with um, have not come from biology. They've actually come from places like tech, or they've been you know heads of engineering at different companies beforehand. And so like just making it clear that you don't have to have a biotech background. You can recruit a great CSO, and like that can be you know what you do just to start your company. Um, so I think making that clear as well is sort of um, something that we get to know. That's a call to action right there. Like Laura yeah. has ideas that are multi-billion dollar ideas. She just needs someone to, you know, a founders to come in and do the work and to, to take them to market. Like, right. And it's sort of like, like, like there is a drug, like we know exactly where it is. Like you can probably license it out for like these terms. It's sort of like you know, very, very specific. It's not just kind of like, you know, it'd be great if someone solved this problem. It's like very, very specific ideas. Um, we should like turn this into the YouTube clip or whatever. It's like, this is like a, this is a call to action. I love that. Um, cool. Well, usually we have someone from the audience come in and ask a few audience questions, if that's okay with you. Yeah, sure. Um, oh, I don't worry. That's amazing. Stephanie, what's up? Um, first of all, Laura, that like everything you've been saying has just, I mean, the crowd in uh, um, Discord has just been so excited just because you can literally see how much you love what you do. Um, so thank you for being here. Um, but I just wanted to start with uh, you, just what you were saying before, you know, people in your field are looking for great founders, but everything seems really inaccessible without a PhD or, or a master's or you know, that type of education. So how can somebody entering deal with it? And, and also, I mean, you enter, your first experience with school was MIT. How did you deal with, you know, everybody having all of these degrees and, and maybe not feeling adequate? Yeah, um, so that's a great question. I think, um, if I think about, so, you know, I think there's this maybe incorrect perception that, um, the CEO needs to have like these great technical insights and that's what drives the company. And what I've seen with our best founders has been that they absolutely don't do that. So 
um, there's a few students that I've, I've met, very rare, who, who can do that. And they're, I'm just like, holy cow, that's an incredible combination. And you're so lucky to have that. But most of the best people that I'm working with right now explicitly take their hands off the science and say, my job is to recruit an incredible team and give them all the resources that they need and make sure the culture is, is, is going well. And that is my only job. And anything that I try to do that's stepping into the technology or trying to get my hands in that, like I need to be able to ask all the right questions and to you know, be able to tell when someone's giving me the answer that they think I wanna hear, which is what they, what's actually true. But they like actually the best CEOs, even though some of them are scientists themselves, they have this just amazing ability, I think, to step back and um, accept that their job is now to support and enable others to make those you know, decisions and calls and just to be, make sure that they're asking the right questions and, 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 making, and making the culture, you know, insanely great kind of culture for what they want to achieve. So that, that I think has been amazing to watch and just really inspiring. I think um, scientists love to talk. You know, you can tell, like I come from a background of, of science. I would talk to you about aging stuff for way longer than you'd be excited to hear about it. And I would re-explain stuff and make it, you know, break it down. Cause it's interesting to hear questions from people who are outside your field that help you uncover stuff you didn't already know. Um, so I'd say the one thing that you, you probably can do is take away all that fear that a scientist is trying to judge you for being less than you are. And I think if you're really humble about what you know and don't know, and you make it clear that your role is to support them. And um, you know, my, my colleague uh, at the fund is you know, great at this. Like you, you can build an incredible culture you know, around that and not around you as the egomaniac CEO telling everyone like what it's gonna be on different experiments where like you haven't been involved in their planning and like you're stepping in to you know, give a specific like microliter designation that like you don't have any authority or sh you shouldn't be making. So that's one thing. I think the second thing is, you know, totally all the time. I, I used to deny this, but like, I mean, it's true. Like I, I just had so much FOMO around not having a degree for a long time or not, I, I'd say it's not having a degree. It, it's not um, like having legible academic credentials. And I think it's good to feel that. Like I, you shouldn't assume that you're good at like evaluating science or, or thinking about it a priori. Like that should be something that like takes a really, really long time to build confidence in. Or at least that's kind of how I thought about it. And I think now there's enough science projects that I worked on in the past that have now turned into drugs that are now like, you know, in patients and where there's like a lot of great clinical evidence that um, I have a lot less of that personally, but um, I, I, I did used to feel that way, I think a lot. And I, I, I think I was really grateful that, you know, I, I had that, um, Sort of uncertainty and that like I had that push to always try and make sure that I, I could explain things down to the atom level and like that that's the only way that you really can you know I, I guess try and prove to yourself that you know what you're talking about but <laughs> well that that's a great okay. answer and and on that you know I guess that topic of uncertainty and, and fear really um I have a we have, the crowd has uh, a big question in terms of you know death <laughs> like uh, do you believe in an afterlife do you are you scared of death how, how do you feel about it um I mean, I think, um, <laughs> so my answer on this has changed a lot over time. I think when I was a kid, it was just like incredibly scary and motivating. And then over time it's become like more something that I understand, but I think like there, it, it's just, it's just kind of this really interesting challenge. Like it, it's, it's very focusing, like, okay, like you're either going to die or you're not going to die. <laughs> and, like you're probably going to die, but like there is actually a world in which like, that's not true, at least for someone at some point in the future and they have a choice. And, and so I'd say the biggest thing that I don't like about death, it's not death itself. It's not like that no one should ever die and that's a bad thing. It's, it's that we don't have any choice. Um, and then it's so obvious that our current lifespan is like not the optimal lifespan. Like why should it be, you know, in the your 70s, 80s, like because evolution randomly came up with that number a while ago and like we kind of push it to its limits. Like that's not a good reason for that being the basis for like all of our social time scales. Um, and like, I think Frank Wolchuk wrote about it's like an incredible amount of knowledge. Every time someone dies, right? Their 70 years of accumulated wisdom is lost. And we have to like rebuild that and boot it up in a new person. You know, that takes a long time. And so um, I think one thing that's really inspiring for me is this question, if Isaac Newton, you know, could live for a thousand years, like who would he be? And what kind of thoughts would he have at the end of that? Um, and I really disagree with a lot of the narratives around people getting bored or stagnant or kind of like fields dying as one person, you know, fields advancing, you know, through a scientist career. I think that's just totally wrong because like, A, there, there's no reason why that should be true, you know, cognitively. And if it is true cognitively in like a way that we want to fix, we can probably fix that. And then also, you know, like lastly, that's just so ageist. Like, it's just a terrible way of looking at things. Um, so yeah, I think I really vehemently object to this idea that, you know, we, we can't continue to do great work like throughout our lives and that somehow like that's a impossibility. So then if you could live forever, 
I mean, and you couldn't work on what you're currently working on, what would you do? I could live forever and I could work on what I'm currently working on. I mean, anything that involves either thinking about atoms like on that level or like trying to understand patterns about the universe uh, mentally, I think would be great. Um, and there, there's a, so much of that to do, I guess. <laughs> that. Okay. Um, well, you mentioned previously about baking cookies near Steve Jobs um, and, and that there were other, you know, epic stories in that timeline. And so I'm, I'm curious to know, like, what's the most memorable story of living in that house? Oh, gosh, um, I probably can't say that. I mean, I'd have to <laughs> like, ask everyone if they'd be OK. Um, I'm not like anything like scandals happened. It, it was just um, all these crazy adventures that I think we'd go on. Um, I think probably the most memorable thing actually is, is the there was the day Steve Jobs died and coming home and seeing like the outside of his house just coated with you know all these objects that people brought kind of in, in memory of him and then watching the speech that he gave at Stanford in our house and like it's so cliche now to say that we did that but like it just somehow like it felt so Silicon Valley and at that time because we we're new to Silicon Valley and we we're just learning about this culture and we we're like looking up to everyone it was like it, it felt like I don't know that this big thing that we got to be like, like, like part of, and it's sort of like, okay, well, you know, we're here now and we want to keep this legacy of like greatness going in a sense. Um, so I, I don't know, like, I, I wouldn't say necessarily like, you know, still agree with all of that, but like, it just, it was a very memorable moment, um, especially for someone who just come to the Valley, I think. It kind of yes. felt like you were part of something at that moment, like see, seeing that happen in Silicon Valley. Yeah, I think so. There's a lot of, there was a lot of, I remember there's always the kind of these two things. There's like this really sarcastic culture of like startups suck and, you know, everyone is stupid and being too cliche and like all the stuff that like felt really bad when we interacted with them. And there's this other kind of culture of like the history of like great technological innovation that like was so real. Like, you know, like all these, like down to the transistor, like all these great specific technologies that had come out of the valley. And I think it just kind of felt like anchoring more towards that and less towards like all the stuff that we were like delusional all the time, but I think really didn't want to like think about, you know, sort of like, why would you spend your time immersed in that? Amazing. Yeah, Laura, thanks for coming on the podcast. It's, uh, it's been a lot of fun. And I think people will really like this, this episode. Appreciate it. Um, Amazing. Any final thoughts or inspiring? I should come up with a final question that I ask everyone, <laughs> but I, I'm always like, you know, kind of making it up on the, on the fly, but any, any inspiring thoughts for the, uh, you know, the 18 year old Laura that would have, you know, who's, who's out there right now trying to, trying to do something super difficult or, um, you know, totally. complex. Yeah. I, I think so. Um, I care about technology and I, I, and not just like metal tech, I care about like atom tech and nanotechnology. And I think the invisible truth is that we're living in a world that is just vibrant with nanotechnology and the manipulations of it. It's called biotech, but like, really it's all about nanotech getting down to the atoms, making them do what you want. And like, there's no time in history, like really that I think well in the past that like could have been more exciting to, to, to work in for that. And like, there are lots of things to do, like join an iGEM team, go work in Symbio, like, you know, get get burned by that, figure out like all the ways that it does and doesn't work. But like, it just, it's, it's hidden in the way that we talk about the field, but like what we're doing with our hands and like with the atoms is so incredibly cool. And so now it's like absolutely, the best time if you want to change the world by moving atoms, like to get into biotech. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. All right, Laura, thanks. thanks for coming on the podcast. It was amazing.